Hello and welcome to my channel, Vice Rhino here. Today we're continuing on with Matt Powell's video Science Falsely So Called. If you're new to the series, feel free to start with part one. Today's topic is called Simultaneous Creation, which I'm sure won't involve Matt misunderstanding that Tech Times article which suggests that 90% of animals evolved one to 200,000 years ago, which itself was a misunderstanding of a study that wasn't even about that. But let's wait for Matt to get into it, shall we? So Tech Times recently came out with an article. Boom. Nailed it. It's a secular group. Uh, these guys aren't Christians, but these guys even came out with an article just last month showing that evolution is a fraud. Nope, they did no such thing. Even if the article were correct, it does not even come close to showing evolution to be a fraud. In fact, this study has been so mischaracterized that the authors of the study had to publish an amendment in the form of a note at the beginning which states, This study is grounded in and strongly supports Darwinian evolution, including the understanding that all life has evolved from a common biological origin over several billion years. This work follows mainstream views of human evolution. We do not propose there was a single Adam or Eve. We do not propose any catastrophic events. The name of the article is Massive Genetic Study Reveals That 90% of Earth's Animals Appeared at the Same Time. Now let's read in the article that you're quoting from. More specifically, they found out that 9 out of 10 animal species on the planet came into being at the same time as humans did some 100,000 to 200,000 years ago. So even if that article were an accurate representation of what the original study concluded, which it wasn't, that still isn't even close to lining up with the creationist model of the universe. When they say at the same time, they are speaking on a geologic timescale which makes a hundred thousand years look like an instant when compared to the billions of years that the planet has been around. But that's still a longer amount of time than you think the universe has existed by two orders of magnitude. That article could have been 100% correct in its conclusion, and it's still would be evidence against creationism. So these guys admit that 90% of animals that we see today all came into being at the same exact time. The same exact time, but with an error bar that spans an amount of time that's longer than you think the universe has even existed. Remember that. Same exact time in this case is still a really long ass time when thinking in human terms. But even then, if 90% of animals did start at the exact same time, what of the other 10%? Let's just think about this for a moment from a creationist perspective. You're using this write-up to prove your point as if it were correct. So if it is correct and fits into creationism, that would mean that 90% of animals were created at the same time, and then 1 to 200,000 years pass before God creates the other 10%. And when do people come into it here? I know you don't consider people to be animals, but Adam had to name all the animals, so would he have been created 200,000 years ago to name the 90% of the animals that were created then? But then Adam only lived 900-ish years, so he would have died before the last 10%. So did God create Adam with the last 10%? But then how does that fit into your literal days of creation? Were there two animal creation days? Did God take hundreds of thousands of years off in the middle without mentioning it? Even if I grant you the article's accuracy, it doesn't fit with your worldview. And it gets worse when you look at the actual study that the article was based on because the whole thing very much relies on an evolutionary theory to come to its conclusions and doesn't even come close to concluding that animal species all came into being at the same time. They were studying mitochondrial DNA, actually just one small part of mitochondrial DNA, to see if it would be a good marker for determining species genetically. They found that any given species had a very low genetic diversity in the particular gene that they were looking at, about 0.2%, no matter the size of the population of the species as a whole or how far it ranges geographically. They used this result to argue that this particular gene in the mtDNA could be used as a genetic marker to define a species. The 200,000 year number just points out the slightly surprising fact that the research found that most species went through mitochondrial uniformity within the last 200,000 years. That is, most animal species that they had studied 
breed had a last female common ancestor within that time frame. This provides a minimum age of the species, they must all be at least 200,000 years old. But it says nothing to a maximum age. And to boot, the way they determined that they went through mitochondrial uniformity is very much intertwined with how they figured out it happened within the last 200,000 years. Going back to the misinterpretation of the study, saying that all species came into existence within the last 200,000 years, what that means is that if you want to throw out the science that gave us the 200,000 year time frame so you can make it fit into your 6,000 years, you are also throwing out the science that says they all came into existence at the same time. So no matter how you look at this mess of bad science journalism, it does not even come close close to supporting creationism. So true science supports a whole bunch of animals being created at one time. Nope. It supports them having gone through some form of genetic bottleneck within the last few hundred thousand years. Not this thing of, oh, this species is just millions of years behind this species. What do you even mean by millions of years behind? Do you think that evolution is some sort of race or something? Organisms are not trying to evolve into some final form that is better than anything else, and there aren't some that are closer to this mystical final form and some that are farther away. It's just a matter of how well they can survive and reproduce in the environment that exists while they are living in it. It's not a linear progression from this animal to this animal to this animal. It's more just the animals just came on the scene. Oh man, you were so close. Because it, it's not a linear progression, not by any stretch of the imagination. But there is nothing anywhere in the scientific literature that even comes close to suggesting that everything just came onto the scene all at the same time. And they're having to admit that. No, not really. I mean, we're not having to admit anything. It was mildly surprising that there seems to have been mitochondrial uniformity within most species in the last few hundred thousand years, but that's not an admission, it's a discovery, and it needs further study before it's confirmed. In analyzing the COL of 100,000 species, Stokel and Thaler arrived at the conclusion that most animals appeared simultaneously. First, it's not COL, it's COI. And further confusing matters, the I is actually a Roman numeral in cytochrome C oxidase 1, which that's an abbreviation for, so it might be more properly called CO1. I'm tempted not to give you a hard time about messing this up because, quite frankly, I'm not sure myself if it should be COI or CO1, but at least I made sure I'm saying the right letter. Second, I find it interesting that you quote the part of the article that doesn't say what kind of time frame they're talking about when they say things like simultaneously. Just a little bit earlier in that article is where they bust out the 1 to 200,000 year line. Why'd you read past that to use only the bit that leaves it unclear? Oh, that's right, it's because when they say simultaneous, they mean geologically simultaneous and are referring to a longer period of time than you think even exists. I'm going to pull out my trump card now. Part 5 of a 7 part video and now is when you pull out your trump card? That's kind of odd, you should have saved that for part 7 or used it in part 1. You always want to start strong and finish strong, keeping your weaker points in the middle. Just a little tip for your future career as a professional con man. So Tech Times just came out with this article. Really? That is your trump card? Is this whole segment going to be just this article? I've probably said this in most of my responses to you so far, but that is super weak. Like Captain America before the super soldier serum weak. Or Mr. Burns trying to steal candy from a baby weak. It's an example of the telephone game at its very worst. A study is published, the press latch onto one sentence of the study and misinterpret it. Then creationists misinterpret the misinterpretation of this one sentence of the study and claim it as a trump card. Seriously, calling the bombardier beetle irreducibly complex is a stronger argument than this, even though that was thoroughly debunked in a 1997 Talk Origins article using sources that go back to the 1970s. But that's my point. Using arguments that were debunked decades ago is a stronger position than claiming this Tech Times article as proof of creationism. I'm skipping a bit now because this part is just a repetition of what he already said at the pulpit earlier, except this time he's saying it to the raging atheist. According to this study, you know, it, it actually debunks evolution. So scientists that are evolutionists, you know, they, they're fighting against coming to these conclusions. But the conclusion is, is that there is a creator. And that's why these species all came, came to being at the same time. The study was done using methods that rely on the fact that evolution happens in order to come to the conclusions that they do. So they used evolutionary methods to debunk evolution? No, I don't think so. If evolution were not true, that study would, quite frankly, not have been possible. This conclusion is very surprising, says Thaler, 
and I fought against it as hard as I could. Now, which conclusion is he talking about here? The one where most animal species that they studied went through mitochondrial uniformity within the past couple hundred thousand years. Now, I don't know why he would have fought against that conclusion. It might simply be because it wasn't the expected outcome. But this just goes to show that scientists are not tied to their preconceived notions. His study found something that went slightly against the consensus, so rather than assume that he had made some major breakthrough, he tried to find out where he went wrong. Because that's the default assumption if you discover something surprising in science. The odds are that you did something wrong, not that the consensus is wrong. So let's find out what that was. Replicate the study, see if the results are repeated under both similar and dissimilar conditions. Try and isolate any potentially confounding variables. If the results are repeatable and consistent, then the consensus will gradually change to accommodate the new data. Where is this article from? Tech Times. Leading science website. Never seen it. Um, don't know anything about it. Can't comment on it. Have no idea. And that is the correct answer when presented with something that you know nothing about. I applaud him for being willing to say that he didn't know and wouldn't comment without knowing about it while being recorded for this. To me, that looks way better than trying to come up with some speculation on the spot without actually knowing anything about it. In a massive genetic study, senior research associate at the Program for the Human Environment at Rockefeller University, Mark Stokel, and University of Basel geneticist David Thaler discovered that virtually 90% of all animals on Earth appeared at right around the same time. Man, you just keep getting closer and closer to that 1 to 200,000 year quote. I wonder if you're actually going to read it at some point and try to hand wave it away, or if you're just going to ignore it. Spoiler, he just ignores it. As to how that could have happened, it's unclear. And that is from a completely different part of the article where they start speculating about some major disaster that wiped out most of life on Earth, which the study definitely doesn't even hint at. That would have been a massive extinction event that we would have found out about through other fields of science like paleontology by now if it had actually happened. But well done making it look like that's what came next, even though the next sentence is the one that debunks your entire argument. This scientist is saying, look, this has debunked tons of the information that we've been given about evolution. No, that's your misinterpretation of the Tech Times misinterpretation of one sentence that the scientist wrote in the paper. What the scientists actually do say is in the note added to the top of their paper in December of 2018, that this study is grounded in and strongly supports Darwinian evolution. And yet people are still going to believe it? This is a secular source. So they have nothing. These evolutionists, they have nothing. The Bible says that all creation cries out to God. All creation points to Christ. All creation points to Christ. So somehow 90% of species evolving within 200,000 years of each other points to one specific guy being executed by the Romans about 2,000 years ago. I would like you to elaborate on your logical pathway there because I just don't see how that follows. So the question of which came first, the chicken or the egg, is a ridiculous question, because it would have to be the chicken. What? Why is this clip even here? When did the chicken and egg question come up in this segment? And why does it have to be the chicken? I'm very confused at what you're even trying to say here. Also, eggs came first. Hard-shelled eggs that could be laid on land first appeared about 312 million years ago. Chickens probably evolved around 8,000 years ago, at a maximum. At least domestic chickens did. I didn't spend enough time on this to find a time frame on the red jungle fowl which chickens descended from, but I can guarantee you that it's significantly younger than 312 million years. The absence of fossil evidence for intermediary stages has been a persistent and nagging problem for evolution. Yep, Gould really did write that in his column in Natural History in 1977. I'm having a hard time finding the exact article, but from what I know of Gould, I am willing to bet that he was talking about the debate between punctuated equilibrium and gradualism. In a nutshell, gradualism holds that evolution progresses at a slow and stable pace, while punctuated equilibrium is the idea that evolution can be fairly rapid given extreme enough selection pressures. And the fact of the matter is that we really don't have as many of the transitional fossils that we would like. But we do have enough to know that evolution happens. 
And you can be 100% certain that if you ever see someone who accepts the theory of evolution say something that makes it look like they are questioning the theory as a whole, you're missing some context. The only way this quote could make any sense from a creationist standpoint would be if it were followed up by Gould's retirement from the study of evolutionary biology. Yet he continued his column in Natural History all the way until 2001, just about a year before he died. So if that quote actually were him calling evolution into question, why would he spend the rest of his life writing a column promoting evolution? It's not like that quote was something he said in confidence to a friend. It was published in his column that promoted evolution. Any rational person would therefore conclude that if this quote is being used to discount evolution, it is being taken out of context. Darwin came out with a theory, and in his book he stated that there must be missing links, otherwise that proves his theory to be false. That sentence made no sense, so let me fix it for you. There must be transitional forms which were missing at the time of his writing. If you do find a link between two species, it can no longer be said to be missing, because that's how words work. And, you know, science has tried to make up a lot of missing links. They've tried to prove it, but they've been proven false. Nope, they most certainly have not. There have been a handful of forgeries that have been discovered as the real transitions become more clear. But now let's address the image that you're showing on the screen. Neanderthal man was based on just one skull that was found by Professor Reiner Proch, who deliberately falsified the age of his findings and was forced to retire in disgrace in 2005. That is a bald-faced lie. Wikipedia has a list of Neanderthal fossils, and there are ten skulls, many of which are complete. There are a bunch of other fossils as well. None of them are credited as being found by Reiner Proch. And while he was forced to retire after being found guilty of fraud and plagiarism, that didn't do anything to show that Neanderthals didn't exist. In fact, we have sequenced the Neanderthal genome. We know that we are a separate species. We know that they interbred with humans sometime after humans started migrating out of Africa because the remnants of their genome can be found in modern non-African humans. We know that their genetic information could enter our genome, but not the other way around. We know that adult Neanderthals were lactose intolerant. We know enough about their existence that we can be certain that they did in fact exist. They've been shown to be fraudulent in the missing links that they try to provide. Um, and so, you know, basically all these missing links that are supposed to exist, they're, they're not there, they don't exist. Are you talking hominid missing links? Because we have a pretty good record of hominid evolution. Reptile mammal transition? Well documented. What about whales? Another group that we have a very good record for. And we just found another link in the chain in a four-legged hoofed whale ancestor called Paragocetus pacificus. And I say recently found, but it was found in 2011. They just took that long studying it before publishing their results, because we don't just find something that looks like it might fit and then assume that it does. It needs to be rigorously studied first. And I could go on. We have plenty of evolutionary links. Sure, not as many as we would like, but they are definitely there. We have had enough of the Darwinian fallacy. It is time that we cry, the Emperor has no clothes. I'm sure all of you are going to be completely shocked to find out that this quote was taken out of context. <gasps> I know this far in we're expecting nothing but honesty and sincerity from Matt and company. Just kidding, we have plenty of evidence at this point to support the idea that Matt is not only wrong about everything that he says, but knows that he's wrong and is lying about it. This quote was taken from an article published in Geology titled Darwin's Three Mistakes. In it, Dr. Sue points out several things that Darwin got wrong and chastises scientists for holding Darwin up on a pedestal. It was written in 1986, and honestly, it would have been more surprising if a scientist writing more than a century after Darwin could not have found anything wrong. The second part of the article that that quote was taken from, however, was a section where he opposes social Darwinism. That's the Darwinism that creationists always try to equate with evolution, where the racists have sometimes used evolution as an excuse for their racism. Allow me to read a bit more of the quote to provide some needed context. Darwinism was also used in a defense of competitive individualism and its economic corollary of laissez-faire capitalism in England and America. Not only capitalists, but also socialists welcomed Darwinism. Karl Marx thought Darwin's books important because it supported the class struggle in history from the point of view of natural science. Worst of all, Darwinism opened the door to racists who wanted to apply the principle of natural selection. 
George Bernard Shaw wisecracked once that Darwin had the luck to please everybody who had an axe to grind. Well, I also have an axe to grind, but I am not pleased. We have suffered through two world wars and are threatened by Armageddon. We have had enough of the Darwinian fallacy. It is about time to cry the Emperor has no clothes. The Armageddon bit was referring to the Cold War, of course, which was still going on when this was written in 1986. And I will point out that Dr. Sue accepts the theory of evolution as true, so once again, even if we didn't know the context, we could apply the principle that someone who accepts evolution saying something that apparently contradicts that acceptance is probably being misquoted or quote-mined. The first part of the scientific method is to make an observation. How has anybody observed an animal change from kind to kind? That's not how evolution works. First, you would need to define kind. But then you'll have to understand that we don't grow outside of our ancestry. Every organism with a eukaryotic ancestor is eukaryote kind. Every organism with a vertebrate ancestor is vertebrate kind. Every organism with an amniote ancestor is amniote kind. And so on and so forth. This is why birds are classified as dinosaurs, because dinosaurs were their ancestors. This is why whales are quadrupeds, because quadrupeds were their ancestors. If a monkey gave birth to a human, that would throw a huge wrench into the workings of evolution. Maybe even a monkey wrench. Now I'm about to skip a huge chunk of the video because he just rehashes a bunch of stuff that's already been covered and spends a large amount of time just saying evolution is dumb, abiogenesis is dumb, the Big Bang is dumb, and stuff like that. I do feel the urge to reply when he says that sort of thing, but ultimately it's just them hurling insults without substance and as such would be a waste of time. And a lot of times, you know, atheists get sick of us using the same examples over and over again, but yet, why don't you address those examples? You can't prove them wrong. You get mad that we say them over and over again, but you don't really prove them wrong, you just say, well, you know, that we've heard that example before, so why are you saying that again? We don't get upset that we've heard those examples before. We get annoyed that the examples you bring up have already been thoroughly and utterly debunked, yet you keep repeating them as if they're some sort of gotcha. We're not annoyed at the repetition itself, but at the stubborn refusal for you guys to accept any form of correction. And we know that you're incapable of accepting any form of correction, because if you accepted all the corrections that have been made to the creationist arguments, you wouldn't be left with creationism, you'd be left with a several billion year old earth and evolution. Plenty of Christians learn to accept these facts and accommodate them into their worldview, but if you tie the issue of salvation to the age of the earth, then that makes it impossible for you and ends up being the hill to die on. And I hate to break it to you, but the hill that you're dying on has been blown out from under you for decades. And you know this, the Grand Can Canyon argument has been argued on both sides. It's a stalemate. You know it. You're not being untruthful. You're just rejecting a certain side of the truth. The Grand Canyon is nowhere close to a stalemate. Any scientific study of anything about the Grand Canyon shows conclusively that it is millions of years old and was formed slowly by the Colorado River. It is physically impossible for the Grand Canyon to have formed the way that creationists suggest. Just look at all the bends in it. Why would it bend like that if there was a torrent of flood water ripping through soft sediment? I'd like to see some sort of creationist experiment where they managed to get a strong current of water to double back on itself like that while still violently carving through the sediment. So we have blood of a Tyrannosaurus rex that was discovered inside this grave of the dinosaur. Now, if it was 65 million years extinct or before us, how did that blood remain the same? I'm going to skip the soft tissue bit and instead leave a link to a video on the channel stated clearly that deals with this claim. It does an excellent job of explaining what happened and how this so-called soft tissue could have survived. And what's more, in 2017 a study was done that suggests that the soft tissue could have been the result of cross-contamination rather than actually being preserved inside the bone. So even though we now know how soft tissue could have been preserved for that long, we don't necessarily have any examples of this happening yet. The Bible says that God hangs the earth upon nothing. It also says that it has foundations and sits on pillars. Why are all of those verses metaphorical, but the one single verse that says it hangs on nothing is literal? That the earth hangs on nothing. The Bible obviously says in Isaiah chapter 40, is he that sitteth upon the circle of the earth. So the Bible talks about the earth being a circle. Yup, it sure does say that it's a circle, which any kindergartner will tell you is a 2D shape, not a 3D shape. The same kindergarten will also explain to you that a sphere would be the 3D version of a circle. But somehow the all-knowing creator of the universe got confused by kindergarten level geometry. 
And don't tell me that ancient Hebrew didn't have a word for sphere, they definitely had words that could have been used that would have been more accurate in that context. For instance, the Hebrew word for Baal, which was used in Isaiah 22.18. How did Job know about the equator? The circle of the earth. Nice, you're equating the circle with the equator. Too bad the Bible doesn't actually make it clear that this is what it's talking about. It is far more likely that when he said circle, he meant the disk that they thought the earth was at the time. That was the generally accepted picture of the earth from that region in that time, so it makes way more sense that Job would have been writing about this disk earth, not the equator. Um, you know, it's been scientifically proven again and again that the earth is young. Nope, it most definitely has not. If it had, you would be able to provide actual scientific sources for that claim rather than just repeating that claim over and over. And, you know, just because somebody makes a claim with a straight look on their face doesn't mean that that's going to be the truth. You saying that is the ultimate irony. It's also the only correct thing you've said so far in this entire video. And that's where I'll end it, as the remaining minute or so of this segment is just Matt playing clips of the Raging Atheist and Richard Dawkins talking about the possibility of an extraterrestrial origin of life, which is something he gets into in his next segment, so I'll deal with it then. Today's comment of the day comes to us from Philip Harrington, who writes, I have noticed that many evolutionists simply assume evolution and never seem to back up why they do. No one would bother with that every time they said something, but for the most part they simply make assumptions and use assumptions to discredit what is in the ground. If you're referring to the common layperson, they don't have the credentials required to provide their own evidence. This is why the scientific consensus is important. Some people spend their entire lives trying to understand a very narrow bit of science, and those people share the results with the rest of us. If these people who devote their entire lives to understanding how life developed on the planet, then what hope do I, someone with zero scientific credentials, have of debunking their entire careers? This is why my videos list sources from people who know what they're talking about, and why I try to take corrections gracefully. I am not an expert, for me to speak as though I were would be disingenuous, but to expect me to come up with my own evidence for evolution when there is a plethora of evidence that has already been put out there by people who are much smarter than me is quite ridiculous. So that does it for today, remember to follow me on Twitter and Facebook and support me on Patreon. See you next time! <laughs>